Um, so welcome to this uh, short series of uh, uh, talks on the topic of uh, the uh, foundations of uh, learning Bayesian networks. The first two uh, presentations are going to be uh, focusing on the on the basics on the foundations. And uh, especially if you don't know Bayesian networks, or if uh, your knowledge of Bayesian networks is not systematic, it's a good idea to uh, bring uh, everybody to the same uh, uh, common denominator. Um, the first session is going to be a, a really introductory, introduction to uh, Bayesian probabilistic inference and modeling. Um, here is the, uh, the outline. Um, the second uh, session is going to be uh, focusing on Bayesian networks. It's going to be probably shorter, just Bayesian networks, what they are theoretically, and what's the big deal about them. The third session is going to be probably the longest, um, is uh, going to focus on learning Bayesian networks. Uh, sometimes people call it causal discovery, because as you will see, there is uh, uh, um, the, the foundations are quite good, and um, you can interpret learning Bayesian networks as discovering causal graphs. If uh, there is interest, if you are interested and uh, I would like to see that I have also prepared a fourth uh, uh, set of slides on uh, model validation. Uh, the first session is going to be focusing really on fundamentals. So most of these things you already know. Please bear with me. I'm going to go faster if um, um, unless I get signals from you and questions from you, in which case I will uh, I will just stop and uh, and uh, talk more about things. So fundamentals is essentially a joint probability distribution, marginal distributions, conditional distributions. These are really fundamentals that we will use a lot in uh, uh, in uh, in the future. Um, Bayes theorem and then um, the really big deal about Bayesian approach is uh, subjectivist uh, view to uh, approach to probability. As I said, it's going to be an introductory session. What, you, what I want you to get out of this is uh, just relating whatever you know already to, um, to, to this uh, material. Understand the fundamental role of the joint probability distribution and uh, also the intuition behind Based theorem. What is the motivation for all this? Um, when you have data, as you probably know, um, data tends to be very noisy. Once I gave a presentation at an AI conference that was uh, 20 years ago or so, and I was one of the first people presenting their Bayesian networks, and there was a question, what is, uh, uh, how do you deal with exceptions? I was kind of blown off my feet. What, what, what do you mean by exceptions, I asked. And uh, the person asking the question said, "Exceptions is where uh, exception is when you have a, for example, a smoker who doesn't get a doesn't get cancer, or a non-smoker who gets cancer." And my answer was actually very simple: um, the whole world consists of exceptions. So if you look at these data, these are just artificial things I just put. You notice that there are young people who get cancer, uh, there are old people who are smokers who don't get cancer. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There's just a lot of lot of noise. Data are not atypical like data like this, and there, there are many reasons for that. Uh, there are errors in measurement. For example, uh, the cancer may be misdiagnosed, may be false positive or false negative. Subjects may pro uh, provide wrong information about their age or their smoking status. There may be latent variables that we have never measured that we don't control that can uh, cause things. There can be also, of course, uh, uh, subject selection and, and bad luck. So, in other words, noise is prominent. It was expressed by Benjamin Franklin in a letter to his friend that uh, in the world, um, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. We can, we are guaranteed to die at some point, and uh, we are guaranteed that somebody will tax us. Of course, that's a, a very joking statement, but uh, what he wanted to say is everything is uncertain. Because we are going to focus on learning, um, we need to deal with, uh, with uncertainty. 
any formalism that is not capable of handling uncertainty correctly is uh, going to be bound to do something suboptimally or incorrectly. That's of course a joke. Our statistician will drop in and explain why you have nothing to worry about. And there is a statement that I really like, and uh, to many of you, may, it may sound may sound ironic. Um, by uh, uh, Pierre Simon Marquis de Laplace, uh, uh, who made uh, quite a number of contributions to probability theory, uh, he said in his uh, in the pre uh, preface to his uh, uh, most uh, important book that the theory of probabilities is really just uh, common sense reduced to calculation to calculus. Sounds ironic because those of you who have taken statistics probably find it one of the hardest um, uh, uh, branches of mathematics. But uh, you have to trust me that after 30 years, more than 30 years of working in this field, I do agree with, with him that um, there is always intuition behind probabilistic uh, inference, probabilistic modeling. Um, and of course, uh, theorems, proving things is quite complex, but the intuition is quite, uh, quite always there. And I'll try to to give when, when, whenever I talk about anything, I'll try to bring that intuition forward. An important thing to realize also with probabilities is that um, it's sometimes very hard to predict something in the short run. For example, if, if I ask you to predict the outcome of a coin toss, you will notice that it's, it's a very hard problem. Um, the accuracy of your predictions will be quite likely <laughs> around 50-50. But uh, statistics and probability uh, makes, make statements about uh, the long run. So even though it's very hard to predict uh, the outcome of a single coin toss, you can be guaranteed that uh, when the number of tosses uh, goes to infinity, you will see regularities, very strong regularities. And that's what statistics and probability are about. Of course, you can make uh, predictions in the short run, and if you make many predictions like that using probability, in the long run, you'll be better off than when you are not using probability in, in the long run again. So um, really very, very uh, brief review of uh, things that are relevant. Why are we using probability and statistics? It's uh, um, Essentially, it's based on the same principle that makes you use arithmetics when you go and do shopping in a supermarket. If you don't use arithmetics, you are bound to lose money. Suppose if you, you, if you believe that 2 plus 2 is 5, I can easily pump money out of you. I give you 2 times uh, $2 uh, and uh, receive from you 5. And I will do it until you have no more money. So if you are believing something like that and you are willing to act upon it, you're going to be bound to do something uh, bad. You're going to be bound to lose. There's an argument like that uh, to probability theory called Dutch book argument. Um, many things, maybe everything in, in English that is uh, weird, that is funny is Dutch, as, as you probably know. Going Dutch, Dutch street, uh, double Dutch, uh, Dutch wife, etc. Ma many things like Dutch book, essentially is a, is a situation that you can find yourself in, in which you always lose. Uh, no matter what you do, no matter what you bet, you are going to lose. So it's a betting situation where you are going to always lose. You are going to always lose if you violate any of the three axioms of probability theory. So the theorem, the, the Dutch book argument, tells you essentially, no matter what you do, no matter what, uh, what formalism you use, for processing uncertainty, if that formalism violates any of the three axioms of probability theory, is going to lead you to, prov to provable losses. So um, like in the in case of arithmetics and a supermarket, um, probability theory and processing uncertainty, they go together. An important thing that uh, um, I'll probe, I'll come back to it a couple of times at least in the rest of the, of the meetings, um, the probability. Probability is essentially a measure of uh, uncertainty over an event, X in this case. The important thing that I wanted to, to say here, in addition to just the basic things that probability 
can be over. Uh, uh, a microphone not muted. We got feedback. Um, um, so um, we can have discrete events and uh, uh, we can also have continuous events. Uh, both of these events can be, um, can be measured by probability. And uh, the important thing that I wanted to show in this slide is this Xi, it's a, it's a Greek letter. I just wanted to, to take the most complex Greek letter that I can imagine. Um, any probability, any event is conditioned on something. And that's usually the background. It's an important thing, I'll come back to that. And probability that doesn't have a background just doesn't exist. So in every situation that you put a probability over something, there's always some background knowledge, background information, saying uh, more things about the event, uh, about the data that you collected, etc. <clears throat> Probability distribution, um, this is just any distribution I, I found on the, on the, uh, on the internet. Um, it's essentially telling you how um, likely different values, different states of a variable are. This is a continuous distribution. It's a normal distribution. We, uh, we see that uh, uh, things, uh, values around the mean around here are very likely. Uh, the further you go from the mean, it's less likely, etc. You, you've seen that, you know what it is, so we can just continue. I just wanted to, to throw this idea of probability distribution. There are many distributions that are parametric, proposed by statisticians, and um, uh, they are convenient because you can express um, um, how a variable, you, you can dis express the probabilities over different states of a variable, by means of one, two, or three numbers, two, two, three parameters, very, very convenient. And some of the distributions are based on physical properties of the world. For example, normal distribution is very, very common. It's explained by a very powerful theorem in statistics known as a central limit theorem. <clears throat> central limit theorem says that if you sum infinitely many random variables, the sum is going to be distributed normally, as long as these variables are not too weirdly distributed. And uh, it's a powerful theorem. In fact, one way of generating samples from normal distribution is generating as few as 12 numbers from uniform distribution, add them, uh, normalize, and then you get beautiful uh, normal curves. That powerful is the theorem. So here are some pictures of uh, distributions. There are quite a number of them, <clears throat> and uh, some of them are uh, really very useful. All of them are useful. Some of them are really useful. Histograms is a way of um, looking at a data that uh, uh, makes a step towards distribution. So if you have data, what you do is you divide the, the domain into buckets, into small intervals, and then you count how many records, how many values fall into each interval, and you, you plot it. That is uh, pretty much showing you, uh, giving you insight into the distribution from which the data were generated. Um, we see here an attempt to fit the normal curve to this, uh, to this data um, that can be done. Uh, an important thing is that uh, uh, histograms uh, uh, look differently depending on the bean size. So as you change the bean size, you'll see that the data look differently. So these are the same data, uh, just uh, the bean size was changed. In uh, Gini, which I will use uh, quite a lot uh, later on in the course to, uh, to show you uh, some things, uh, Gini allows you to change the dynamically, but just with an arrow key, you can go left and right and you can see how the data look like, and that gives you a lot of insight into the data. Um, the same, uh, here's another distribution, uh, data taken from, a, from uniform distribution, the same idea. When you change the bin size, you'll see that it looks very different. So these were uh, things that you can do with uh, one variable, just one variable. Much more important in um, the whole, uh, whole uh, field of modeling is uh, joint probability distribution. A joint probability distribution essentially expresses uh, the probabilities of events that are defined over several variables. 
Here's a picture that I took somewhere from the internet. Also, we have two variables, mw and a max. And this, uh, there's an analogy to a map, um, like three-dimensional map. You see uh, combinations of values of uh, the two variables that are much more likely than others. Like you see that uh, small values of a max with smaller values of mw are very likely to see this mountain here. And then you have another mountain there. And then the combinations where a max is uh, large are, are rather unlikely. So that uh, is uh, much more important than uh, the uh, distributions over uh, single variables. Why is that? And the reason for that is that if you have joint distribution over several variables, what you can do is, um, uh, given uh, the values of some of the variables in your joint distribution, you can um, calculate, you can estimate the probability distributions of the remaining variables. For example, if I have a joint distribution uh, of two variables, the amount of work that a student puts into a course, and then the grade that the student will achieve, if I have that joint distribution based on my uh, on data, let's say from previous years, once I uh, ask a student, how many hours do you spend uh, on this course uh, per week? Say the student tells me five hours a week. I can tell the student, oh, uh, it looks like uh, your grade is going to be around C+. Of course, there are exceptions. It's, there's a lot of uncertainty, but it's quite uh, uh, safe to make a prediction from the joint probability distribution. Um, there's another plot in statistics uh, that gives a lot of insight into the data. I absolutely advise you to, to look at your data with your uh, uh, bare eyes, because human eyes are incredibly sensitive to different kinds of patterns. So the distributions, the, the histograms, and also scatter plots. This is called scatter plots. It shows you um, how uh, two variables uh, are distributed in the data. You see that uh, every point corresponds to two values. Let's say this point corresponds to value 51 and 53. Um, and uh, every point corresponds to a pair of values. The pair of values was taken uh, from, each pair of values was taken from the data. A very insightful plot worth absolutely to look at. What uh, statisticians often do is they try to fit uh, functions to that. Um, th this procedure is called regression. Linear regression is trying to fit uh, a line to, to, uh, to points like this. Um, there is uh, uh, another attempt to, um, to capture things that are happening in the data known as correlation. Correlation essentially is a measure of uh, linear dependence. It's calculated in such a way that it assumes that the data are um, related linearly. Let me go back to the previous slide. You see that uh, it's not really a line here. We can see some curvature in this uh, dependence between the two variables. But still, um, you, you assume it, it's a line and then calculate one number that tells you how strong that uh, dependence is. The same for, for these data, um, you assume that it's a linear relationship and then you try to fit uh, a line to that. And uh, a measure of linear dependence, uh, correlation. Correlation is, uh, of course, a great idea. With one number, you see how things are dependent, at least linearly. Uh, but um, it is also guilty of a lot of confusion in statistics. It was uh, developed in uh, the end of 19th century by Francis Galton. And uh, this one step too far that he took is uh, uh, to say that uh, this measure should replace causation. And uh, mm, that lasted for probably around 100 years, uh, that confusion. Um, only now, for the last, I guess, maybe 20 years, there's a lot of uh, interest in statistics to actually look at causation and uh, model, model causation, discover causation. But for a long, long time, um, statisticians were quite scared to use the word cause. And uh, in most statistics textbooks, uh, beyond the reference to causality was correlation does not mean causation. Correlation sometimes makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense. 
uh, smoking and lung cancer, if we suspect, if we know that there is a causal relation, correlation tells you about the strength of that relation, if, it's, if the dependence is linear, of course. Correlation can be also tricky. Uh, people, sometimes people are afraid to go to hospital saying, well, everybody I know who went to hospital died, right? Or there is a negative correlation between uh, quality of the surgeon and success of operation. It turns out that the best surgeons have uh, the worst uh, statistics. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you that, those examples. Or ice cream consumption and drowning. The more ice cream con is consumed, the more uh, people drown on a given day. These are all uh, actual correlations that we know of. Uh, when you have a data set, uh, in this case, we have a data set consisting of eight variables. What you can also do is you can calculate a correlation matrix when the data are uh, continuous. In this case, uh, we have um, correlation between every pair of uh, variables. So every pair like upread and spent, the correlation is 0.6 between the two. Diagonal, of course, correlation is one because every variable is perfectly correlated with itself. And then the matrix is uh, um, uh, triangular because it's symmetric around the diagonal. Correlation is a symmetric measure. So rejection rate and spent is the same correlation as uh, rejection rate and spent. So this number would be the same at, as this one. Perfect symmetry here. Correlation does not mean causation. I will get back to that in the uh, when we talk about learning uh, Bayesian networks and, and causality. That's true, uh, indeed, but uh, tr it's not the whole truth, as you will see. It's true, but not the whole truth. Um, so uh, when it's not the whole truth, you know, uh, okay, it's it's valuable, but not completely valuable. Uh, that's the statement. The next thing that you will hear a lot in Bayesian networks is a marginal probability distribution. Here is another picture that I that I stole uh, from somewhere. Uh, is um, if this is a joint distribution, remember this map analogy I, I showed you a three dimensional picture. This is two dimensional, but but trying to model three dimensions. It's like a map. This is a mountain, dark red, and then uh, lower and lower. So if this is a joint distribution between these two variables, if you shine a, a lamp on the left, you get a shadow on the right, on the margin. Uh, this actually, this picture shows many shadows, maybe, maybe many variants of this distribution. Let's assume there's just one, the, the, the one that is uh, the, the thickest. This distribution shows you the probability distribution over this variable. It's the marginal distribution over this variable. And you can imagine that as uh, light shining to, the, uh, to this uh, joint distribution. And it's a shadow on the margin. That's why the name marginal. The marginal of, of this variable is right here. Uh, it's showing you shadow of this mountain when it's perfectly in this direction, as you see. If you have a joint distribution, you can easily derive uh, marginal. And that's what is also happening in Bayesian networks, you see that Bayesian networks model the joint distribution, and you can easily derive marginal distributions. Conditional distributions is another thing. If, if you have a joint distribution over um, two variables, say like this one, if you pick the value of one variable, you can calculate the uh, con conditional distribution over the other one. Here you can imagine that as uh, slicing it with a sharp knife. I'm slicing it at uh, in this direction at value six, and the, um, the margin, uh, the conditional distribution is going to look like something like this, going this way, this way, and that way. It's a slice of this distribution. That's con conditional. If I pick a different condition, of course, I'll get a different distribution. It's going to look something like this. Um, three um, uh, slides, uh, uh, three or four slides uh, on a technique that is used a lot to gain intuition into distributions. The technique is known as Venn diagrams. So it comes from a name of the mathematician uh, Venn. Um, essentially, you show you you show uh, probabilities by mean by uh, sets. 
if S is the, um, the, the, the world, let's say, and A is some subset of it, you say that the probability of A is proportional to the area of A within S. So if you look at the, the picture, you see that probability of A is around uh, uh, 0.3, let's say. It's um, the probability of A. Probability of B3 is um, one in 10 roughly because uh, it's one takes, taking one tenth of the whole area. Now, an important uh, thing, it, a definition of um, a conditional probability, um, probability of A conditional on B is by definition, probability of A and B happening together divided by the probability of B. It makes perfect sense uh, uh, in Venn diagrams. Um, you can see why the definition. If you want to calculate the probability of A given B1, uh, how do you calculate it? Well, you look at the common uh, part between A and B1. This is in the definition. That's this. A is here, B1 is here. So the common part is essentially B1. And you divide by the probability of B, B1. So the probability of A given B1 is one. When B1 happens, A is sure to happen. A simple example, if you um, um, suppose you are pregnant, it's B1. If you are pregnant, you are a biological woman by definition. Um, um, this one is uh, really the, the, what the picture was for. Probability of A given B2, when B2 happens, you are now in this smaller world where where B2 is true. B2 is true. And uh, probability of A given B2 is essentially the common part. So A and B2 within the new world, the new picture, B2, how often is A true? Well, that's A and B2. And then you divide by B2, which is uh, essentially normalizing that. So the probability of A given B2 is around 0.9. Probability of A given B3 is zero. The common part between A and B3 is uh, empty. Probability of uh, A given B3 is zero. Now, an, an interesting and cool thing, um, I saw it first explained by Yuda Pearl. Here is the mathematical definition of independence. Independence uh, between A and B is by definition when probability of A and B occurring together is the, is the product of each of them occurring separately. Very difficult to grasp the intuition of this uh, definition. If I ask you whether A and B1, A and B2, and A and B3 are independent, uh, most of the time when I do that in a, cl in a classroom setting, students make the mistake saying uh, A and B1, yes, they are, they are dependent, they are not independent, B2, they are in, uh, not independent. But when they see A and B3, very often they say A and B3 are independent. There are two reasons for this mistake. The first is that um, the definition of uh, independence is not terribly intuitive. But uh, the second uh, reason is that Venn diagrams are not very good in showing independence. We mix uh, independence with the set, uh, uh, set theoretic uh, um, Ex exclusion and when they are they don't have a common part we mix it up with independence here is another definition of independence as i said this is uh, i saw it for the first time in uh, yuda pearl's work much much uh, easier if you go back to the, defin the original definition and you divide both sides of this equation by probability of b what you will get on the right hand side is probability of a and on the left-hand side, probability of A and B divided by probability of B, if I go um, uh, two slides back, please note that I will get the definition of conditional probability of A given B. So when I go back here, I, uh, by dividing by the probability of B both sides, you get the following definition of independence. Two things are independent if um, uh, A is independent of B, 
if learning B tells you nothing about A, in other words, conditional probability of A condition on, on B, so we learn B, is the same as before learning B. It tells me nothing. If I look out of the window and I see uh, far in the distance, um, well, actually, no, it, 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 not a good example. Uh, that is another example for another slide. Uh, suppose I learn, um, I, I, uh, one of you, I, I can pick one of you um, randomly, and uh, uh, I uh, look at your shoe size, right? And uh, uh, I want to estimate uh, your uh, intelligence, let's say IQ. Learning uh, the shoe size will tell me nothing about your intelligence, right? Uh, so my expectation of uh, the random person I pick from among the, the listeners is that you are fairly smart. Uh, you are all scientists. If I learn additionally shoes, the shoe size, well, boy, uh, tells me nothing about uh, the intelligence. It's still the same distribution that, than before. Much easier to understand. Two things are independent if learning one tells you nothing about the other. With this definition, it's much easier to answer these questions. And uh, students no longer make uh, the mistake of uh, saying that uh, B3 and A are independent. In fact, if you learn that B3 is true, then uh, you know a lot about A. Right. If you learn that B3 is true, you learn a lot about A. In fact, you know that A is probability of A is zero uh, because it's such a nice exclu excluding thing. Um, again, I'll take the, the pregnancy example. If you learn that B3 is true, you cannot be a biological male. These are uh, essentially uh, mutually exclusive. Now, the next thing is uh, uh, Bayesian probability theory. As, as you see, we really dwell on the foundations. So please be patient with me. Starting from the next presentation, we'll get really to the core of Bayesian networks and then learning them from data. Um, Bayesian probability theory, the name comes from the um, uh, last name of uh, 18th century Anglican priest, the Reverend Thomas Bayes who uh, published in his life two papers, uh, actually not in his life, because the first paper he published, he was an amateur mathematician. And uh, the second paper he was never sure of. So he left the scribbles in his desk drawer. After his death, his wife found uh, the notes and gave, it, gave them to a friend of uh, Thomas Bayes, um, who read the, them and found them um, ingenious, he found them brilliant, and published after Reverend Thomas uh, Bayes's death. This is the most important of the two papers and the foundations of Bayesian probability theory. In the paper, Reverend Bayes proves uh, Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is very easy to prove. If you take the definition of conditional probability, A given B, and then B given A, you get two equations. When you multiply both sides on the, of the top equation by probability of B and bottom equation by probability of A, you get right-hand sides equal. And then the left-hand hand sides have to be equal too. And then uh, when you tra transform it just a little bit, you get uh, essentially this equation. Very easy to prove. By the way, I forgot one thing to, uh, in on one of the previous slides. Why do why on earth mathematicians don't use this definition, which is uh, much more intuitive? Well, they don't like uh, unnecessarily assuming anything. In order for to get this definition of independence, you need to assume that uh, that B is not an impossible event. So the probability of B has to be bigger than zero because you are dividing both sides by probability of B. Of course, the intuition says that uh, what on earth, who on earth would condition on, a, on an empty, on an impossible event, but it turns out that uh, some mathematicians do, do do that. And uh, because there's an additional assumption involved, mathematicians prefer 
uh, the, uh, the original definition, uh, the one that I showed you. Okay, so um, here, of course, we are multiplying and dividing by probability of A and B. Uh, I guess not terribly easy to, to imagine doing this for impossible events, even though I'm quite certain that mathematicians do that. I, I believe Definetti has, has been playing with, uh, with, has played with these ideas. So now we have this base theorem. It's not just a theorem. Each one of you could prove it in a, in a matter of minutes. It's the interpretation of this theorem. If you look at that, uh, we have on the right-hand side of the equation, probability of A, um, Bayes called it uh, a priori, a prior probability. And then on the left-hand side, we have posterior probability, uh, also called a posteriori from Latin. These are just uh, some uh, um, numbers that are expressing the strength of evidence. If you look at this equation, you, you notice that, uh, that the theorem gives us a mechanism for changing our opinion in light of new evidence. Um, suppose I look out of the window. That was the example that I, that I started uh, bringing up. And far in the distance, I see a human. I don't know anything about that human. Uh, I just see the, the, that it's a person walking on two legs in a distance. And uh, I wonder, is this a woman or a man? Uh, that's my uh, event. Uh, suppose this is the probability of uh, the person being a woman. <laughs> now I, uh, um, I look at, at that uh, person uh, in a distance carefully, and I notice that uh, the person has long hair. I see in the wind, the hair is uh, essentially uh, going to the side of the head of the person. Aha, uh -huh. that tells me something. Of course, imperfectly, because there are women with short hair, there are men with long hair. So it's not a perfect uh, source of information for me, but still uh, the proportion of, um, of uh, people with uh, long hair is uh, uh, higher among women than among men. That's the observation of the world. So now if I express uh, the strength of that evidence by probability of having long hair at all among all people, and then probability of having long hair given that uh, a person is a woman, I can calculate the probability that the person is a woman given that I have seen long hair from a distance. So I can change my opinion in light of new evidence. Very, very useful, very fundamental theorem. Quick example. Um, until 1980s, I believe, in Pennsylvania, there was a mandatory um, test for venereal diseases if you wanted to get a marriage license. So if you wanted to get married, you had to get a permission from the town hall. In the US, that's where um, they control for bigamy and to make sure that people marry only one person and a person that they are allow allowed to marry. Um, once you get the permission, you can get married uh, by anybody. Um, a priest from the Church of the Flying Spaghetti. The church is a joke, but actually there, there exists a church called Church of Flying Spaghetti. So um, to get a license, you have to undergo a mandatory test uh, for venereal diseases. Uh, the idea was that um, they wanted to protect the, the other person from potentially sick, uh, sick person. So now suppose your fiance is coming back uh, with a test and uh, she's looking at, uh, at you and uh, showing you this uh, certificate that uh, the test is positive. So the test says your fiance may have syphilis. Uh, let's, uh, you know, the parameters of the test are very good. I, I suspect it's much better than the COVID test or maybe random screening test for, uh, for drugs, whatever. Uh, these are very good parameters, sensitivity of 98% and specificity of 95. Let the prevalence be very low because it's a generally a young, healthy population um, of uh, Pennsylvania. We have Bayes' theorem. Um, we can calculate the uh, probability of having syphilis given positive test result. Again, we reverse it by probability of positive test result given syphilis divided by probability of 
positive test result, and then a priori probability of having syphilis, which we have here. The first thing we need to do is we need to calculate this uh, probability of seeing a positive test. Uh, for that, we have um, an easy to understand theorem of total probability. Essentially, you condition on every state of another variable and then multiply that conditional probability by the, by the probability of that state. You see, we go through all states of the variable syphilis, syphilis and no syphilis. Easy to understand the theorem. When I plug in the numbers from above, you sort the numbers here um, and then into, into base theorem. I have the prior of one in thousand. That's the prior. And after seeing the positive test result, I can calculate the posterior, which comes out to be around 2%. Um, I wanted to show you how Bayes' theorem works, but also I wanted to, uh, on purpose, to show you that Bayes' theorem can be, uh, statistics, probability theory, can be quite counterintuitive. What is probably counterintuitive for most of you is that the probability is so low still that it's around 2%. So perhaps we shouldn't worry too much about our fiance and uh, just uh, take another test or something uh, because the probability that she has that she is sick is very low still. Let me explain that um, uh, so that intuition, let me explain that in another way um, to show you that Bayes theorem is not wrong here. It's us uh, whose intuition is uh, is failing. Imagine that we have uh, 10,000 individuals um, and every small square on this picture is uh, one individual. We have 10,000 of them. And then um, the red cells here in the lower right corner are the uh, sick individuals. Uh, let's uh, uh, test all of them using the same test. Uh, the sick individuals are going to be detected, pretty much all of them, because 98% sensitivity tells you that uh, 9.8 out of 10 are going to be detected. So let's let them all be detected. Of the people who are healthy, though, we have 95% uh, specificity, which means correctly negative, and 5% false positives which is around 500. So now the probability that uh, a person who tested positive is indeed sick is roughly 10 out of 500, which is around 2%. And that is, I hope, uh, easier to understand. Um, as I said, I, I chose this example on purpose to show you that uh, uh, sometimes a probabilistic system will give you things that you wonder whether they are true. Uh, I'm willing to bet that uh, they are true, <laughs> unless the model is wrong, in which case you need to uh, re-examine and re revise the model. Uh, but here is a picture of Reverend Thomas Bayes that um, uh, they use, uh, they even put it on his grave. But uh, some people say that uh, it cannot be reverend based because uh, it looks like this guy doesn't have a, a wig. And in 18th century, Anglican priests were wearing wigs. So this guy is more, more likely from the 19th century. But anyway, this is uh, meant to be Reverend Thomas Bayes. There is a, a wonderful book. If you want to get a, a good overview of uh, history of uh, Bayesian approach to uh, statistics, I recommend this book by uh, Sharon Burst McGrain with a long title telling you about uh, all the wonderful things that uh, a Bayesian approach to probability uh, did. Uh, if, you, if you don't have that much time, I recommend you a video uh, uh, that she, um, uh, of her talk at Google. Uh, it's just one hour long and a very nice introduction, very nice overview of the most important things from the book. Absolutely recommend it. Um, from not, not only from her book, but, but we know that Bayesian modeling is reliable and it solves hard problems. The nice thing about it is that uh, you can use uh, both data and expert knowledge. The revolutionary thing that uh, Reverend Bayes was talking about in the context of uh, his theorem 
is that he wasn't talking about frequencies uh, as uh, uh, classical statisticians, frequencies uh, are, are talking about probability. Probability is a limiting frequency uh, according to the classical statisticians. Reverend Bayes was talking about measure of belief, uh, just the way I was talking about looking at a person far in a distance and saying, okay, is this a man or a woman? 50-50, uh, it's a man or a woman, right? I was talking about my belief that uh, this is uh, indeed the probability. Um, the difference between Bayesian approach, which people picked up uh, a couple of centuries after Reverend Bayes, um, the difference is that if you ask the question, what is the probability of a nuclear war? A classical statistician will throw up her hands and say, well, we have no clue. A probability is a limiting frequency and nu nuclear war is not a repetitive process. I cannot even imagine uh, the, uh, uh, the thing repeating. So the, the question is completely meaningless. I have no idea what it is. A Bayesian will say no problem. Uh, I can give you that probability, it's 0.24. Another Bayesian may tell you it's one in 100. In fact, if I ask any of you, um, you, will be, you should be able to, to give me that probability. Every one of you has some uh, ideas about uh, how likely a war is, nuclear war, and will give me that probability. Of course, um, we immediately get very worried when we, when we hear that. Uh, it's like, you know, 1960s when this uh, terrible idea made it to the population of Earth that everybody is right. Uh, there are many truths. It's a terrible idea from the point of view of logic. It's impossible. If one person says A, the other person says B, uh, and they contradict one another, then at most one of the two people have, has, is telling the truth, right? At most. Maybe both are lying. Um, so uh, you cannot... Uh, have multiple truths. The same here, we might worry that uh, you cannot have multiple probabilities uh, given by different people. Luckily, luckily, um, the um, Bayesian approach comes with so-called limit theorems. Essentially, they say that uh, no matter what your starting probability is, as long as it's not too weird, if you keep your eyes open, if you observe the world and, um, uh, and update your probability uh, rationally using Bayes' theorem, you will very quickly converge with uh, what uh, classical statisticians would give you. So suppose I, uh, I look at the coin tossing and I start with probability 0.2. That's what I believe. The coin is uh, loaded, uh, heads 0.2, uh, tails 0.8. If I look at uh, several tosses and uh, update uh, the probability very quickly, will I converge to probability 0.5 of, uh, of heads in, my, in a single toss? Um, so um, not as worrying as, uh, as uh, I kind of jokingly said about uh, 1960s. Of course, there is nothing wrong with starting with the uh, right distribution from the very beginning. So, you know, if I talk about coins, I will probably start with 0.5, even though I, I will uh, um, uh, use base, uh, Bayesian approach. The, the main thing, the main uh, reason why it is uh, wonderful to be able to specify um, priors mm -hmm. is that in a situation like this on the previous slide, Classical statistician will tell you, I'm sorry, I cannot do anything here. A Bayesian statistician will say, okay, uh, no problem. I can uh, estimate these probabilities based on my beliefs and I can process uncertainty, of course, conditional on my beliefs. I can, I can do that. So it gives you, essentially, it extends the, the areas where you can do useful work. That's the, the big thing. And uh, that's uh, wonderfully, um, um, we have uh, finished the first part uh, um, that we can, uh, of, the, uh, of the talk, the first series of slides, 
um, more in the next uh, uh, sessions. <laughs>